Now you sound much better. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Hey, everybody. Um, like you said, I'm one of the PGY fours um, and just here to tell you about all of the wide variety of research opportunities that we have here. Um, each of our divisions uh, really has kind of their own um, research um, like area. So we each do meetings, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but you can do research in any of the subspecialties. And a lot of us actually do research in multiple um, of them, especially when you're starting out, you're not sure exactly what you wanna go into. Um, it's very easy to get involved um, in a lot of different types of research here. Um, we also do many different uh, styles of research. So a lot of clinical outcomes. Uh, we do have a lot of database research. We have access to the Pearl Diver database. Um, so quite a few of us do research with that. Um, we also have several basic science um, research projects going on. Um, and then uh, we do have some randomized control trials as well. I know at least for the recon division, um, so like I said, we have research grand rounds. It's about every month. Um, sometimes we're a little busy and skip a month, but um, the research coordinators, the residents, all the attendings, PAs, everyone involved in research gets together um, and go through all of the ongoing projects uh, that that division is, has going on, um, kind of update people with projects and who's going um, to conferences and things. So it's really helpful, uh, keeps you on track and make sure that you're getting done what you need to get done um, and ask the attendings any questions or things that you have about the projects going on. And we even have medical students or brand new interns that don't, you know, aren't quite involved yet. They can always come to these and, you know, attendings will say, hey, we've got this project, we need someone to head it up. And um, that's when you can sign up for new stuff. Um, so these are kind of the main key players um, for the, what we call the research council. Obviously Dr. Chabra is very involved um, and Dr. Brown and Dr. Quay um, are both involved. The three at the bottom um, are all PhDs um, and run kind of different labs. Um, and I'll kind of go into that a, a little bit more. Um, a lot of the basic science research um, is done um, by Dr. Christ, uh, Dr. Quay, and then Dr. Lee. Um, so Dr. Quay's obviously focuses, um, he's one of our recon attendings. Um, he does a lot of femoral osteonecrosis and um, research related to that. Dr. Lee does, he's one of our spine attendings. And um, so he has a lot of uh, research related to um, degenerative spine disease. And um, <clears throat> so they're kind of, the uh, forefront for our basic science research. Um, we also have an exercise and sports injury lab, um, emotion analysis and, and gait analysis lab. Um, and I think more of the sports attendings get involved with research related to that um, and some of our trauma attendings as well. Um, and then we do have, like I said, clinical trials research in each of the divisions. Um, and we have some awesome coordinators that help us um, get through all the IRB approval and um, get involved in, in research that's typically um, with other, uh, other orthopedic departments at other hospitals. Um, so a lot of different projects, different types of projects going on. Um, as residents, we're always supported in our research endeavors. Um, we're encouraged to submit abstracts for regional and national conferences. We do get funding if we get a podium presentation um, and our chiefs go to the AOS annual meeting each year. Um, but a lot of the us residents get to go to other regional and national conferences. Uh, quite a few of us go to the Southern Orthopedic Association meeting and um, AUKUS, uh, which is the recon one, um, OTA for trauma and um, the hand sports, all of them, each of us uh, submits to kind of what we're doing research in and we're always supported in that. Um, at the end of the year, we have our resident research day. It's a departmental research day. We always have a guest speaker. It's a big deal. Um, and each of us gets to kind of present what we've been working on um, over the last year and share our research with the entire department. 
Um, the clinical responsibilities are limited. Um, and so everyone in the ent entire department attends. Um, so it's truly, it's everyone um, is there and, and it's taken very seriously. And it's a, great, it's a great way to kind of show what you've been working on. And then at the end, there is a winner chosen by the panel um, and that's announced at graduation and um, you get a prize and bragging rights. So um, everyone uh, always looks forward to research day. Um, these are some of the projects from our fives and fours from last year. So you can see it, I mean, it's truly a wide variety um, of different basic science research, clinical outcomes, um, even race gender uh, research with surveys. Uh, these are some of uh, the threes and twos research projects from last year. We've got perspective studies um, and it's really, it's. I think our department produces a lot of phenomenal research um, and we're really proud of that. Um, and it's truly up to the resident on how involved they wanna be in research. Um, we are expected to do one publishable um, research project a year uh, through the second through fifth year. Um, but you can be as involved in research as you'd like. Um, I have multiple projects going on and um, I really like research, so I get to do a lot of it. Um, but other residents um, stick to one or two projects a year and that's what their goals are. So it, it's truly about how involved you want to be. Um, and despite whatever subspecial, subspecialty you're going into, you can truly do research in whatever you want to. Um, so there's endless encouragement from the department and our attendings and ample opportunities to get involved. So um, it's, it's really our, if that is something that you're interested in, the, the department certainly uh, helps you achieve your goals. Um, this is just a picture of the Shenandoah National Park in my, uh, my class on our last day as PGY2 is taking call together overnight. So very happy there, um, despite being outside of the emergency department. But um, I hope uh, if y'all have any questions about research, um, feel free certainly to reach out to me um, personally or any of us, we're, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Nicole, thank you, uh, Nicole. I just wanted to make a couple comments. I think the, the extension of our residents being successful in research uh, is the fact that they get some of the best fellowships in the country year in and year out. And uh, it's because they're not just great clinicians, but they're also academically very productive. And a lot of fellowships are looking for that uh, in their fellows. So I think there's a direct correlation to that. And in addition, you know, one of my goals when I started as chair several years ago was to make, to facilitate research. So, you know, we hired, I hired a clinical trials director, a motion analysis director, a tissue engineer, and then also uh, hired, um, you know, we have about seven full-time coordinators who support all the department, all the divisions. And we have monthly uh, research meetings, uh, divisional research meetings. So there's a lot of brainstorming. There's a lot of discussion of research every month. And, and that results to and a lot of opportunities for residents and, and fellows to do projects. So there's no uh, shortage of projects, but I wanted to make research easy and the fact that building an infrastructure to allow you to do projects. So you shouldn't be surprised that some residents leave this residency with you know, 20, 30 papers easily. And, uh, and the, the reason it happens is because we have an infrastructure with you know, navigating IRBs and, 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 and helping with a lot of the, um, the, the clinical, uh, clinical trials or clinical research papers uh, and projects that we uh, we have them going on, but, you know, we have a, and I support, if you're presenting, putting present presentation at a national meeting, uh, I'll support uh, you to, to go there uh, for that meeting. Uh, I don't know what that means for COVID right, with COVID right now, but that's what we've done pre-COVID. So eventually uh, we'll be back to that too, when there's in-person meetings. Winston, any other comments? Yeah, I'm just a comment that you know, Nicole is one of our star residents. She came with a big research interest. And I think that as a program director, I want to make sure that I'm clear that you know, research is a part of our program. It's not, it, it's not what defines all of our residents. We've got a lot of excellent clinical residents who excel 
um, areas outside of research, you know, who do a great job from a standpoint of patient care, um, you know, do a great job as, as far as being a good resident. So, I mean, we have the infrastructure to do high level research. We also, as many residents who publish 20 papers, we have many that you know, don't publish as many. So like, I don't want you to think that um, it, it's definitely a part of our program, but it's everybody can be a little bit different as far as what their drive is. Um, I will say that it's helped a lot of residents get great fellowships. Uh, from the standpoint of having a CV that's really outstanding. And so, I mean, Nicole uh, Quinlan's CV is, would, should be probably promoted to associate professor based on her, on her uh, CV. So she's obviously uh, been a real star in our program. So I think if given the opportunity and given the uh, infrastructure, I think residents can be productive. And I think it will uh, be a great way to uh, build your interest in orthopedics and orthopedic research and be part of the science that leads us the next, uh, the next through this evolution of orthopedics. So with that being said, um, if there are any questions about research, I'm sure Nicole would be happy to ask. You can always forward questions to me. Uh, if you have a big interest in research, obviously we can uh, we can discuss kind of what opportunities might be here as you go forward, okay? So um, with that, what I'd like to do is kind of transition to our, the didactic portion of this, uh, this session. We have the hand faculty here tonight um, and uh, Dr. Bobby Chabra, I just want to say a couple of things real quick. I think it's actually fitting that he's uh, that he's going to be our, our final speaker tonight uh, in this didactic series because he really is the, the heart and soul of our program. He was the uh, a faculty when I came in here as a program director, and and he was a big reason why I came here as a resident. And so, uh, for me to be able to uh, be his program director and uh, help him with this program and the vision that he has for this program is, is for me is, is kind of I've come full circle as far as being uh, uh, being in this process. But he is a Truly, the, the what drives our program. He's one of the one of the greatest uh, surgeons and fathers and friends that I know. So I want to turn the podium over to Dr. Chabra, uh, who's going to be talking about Tommy John injuries tonight and, and ulnar collateral ligament uh, injuries. We have some cases as well. So, uh, Dr. Chabra, um, if you have your thing, it looks like you're going to share your screen and maybe real quick, if you could introduce your hand faculty and kind of the hand rotation, just to have an idea of of, of why so many residents from this program go into hand surgery. Uh, a disproportionate amount because of the mentors we have here. So, yeah, so I actually want to spend a second. So, is my screen up, uh, Winston? It is, it is, yep. Okay. But before I talk about this uh, topic, I just want to uh, introduce uh, the hand. And then uh, we're a very extremely busy, who's our uh, division head and director of the Hand Center, uh, Aaron Freelich, who is our uh, uh, Hand Fellowship Director, and Richard Dacus, who is the uh, Vice Chair for um, Diversity, Inclusion, and Clinician Wellness. Um, we uh, have also two plastic surgery colleagues, Brent DeGeorge and Brittany Bahar, and we, the six of us work at the Hand Center. Uh, the Orthopedic Hand Division has two PAs, Amy and Kelsey, who have been working with us for 10 plus years. They're absolutely extraordinary and they're an important part of our team. And we, um, we provide, uh, ex we, we do hand, wrist, elbow. So all elbow fractures, uh, sports elbow, um, all hand and wrist and elbow fractures are handed, handled by the hand, and hand division. Even all the trauma patients, they're handled by my, uh, my division. Uh, we do a lot of micro nerve repairs, nerve reconstructions, um, uh, brachial plexus surgeries, congenital hand, um, we don't, uh, the sports does most of the, uh, does the shoulder arthro arthroscopy and uh, the shoulder replacements, but Dr. Dacus does some shoulder fractures and, and a, an occasional shoulder arthroplasty, but the hand division is hand, wrist, elbow, and micro, and, and uh, microsurgery and nerve surgery. We also do uh, uh, pedicle skin flaps and skin grafts, and, and uh, I, I, I do occasional uh, free vascular fibulas for reconstruction and tumor reconstruction. So. Um, we also uh, cover, um, uh, 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 Dr. Dacus is the uh, hand, wrist, elbow uh, surgeon for James Madison University Athletics, and I'm the hand, wrist, elbow surgeon for UVA Athletics and have been for almost 20 years. We also cover about 14 high schools and many small colleges and provide sports care. Um, I have, I'm very proud of the, the faculty that in the hand division, they're incredible educators, they're incredible surgeons. Uh, I had my, uh, in, uh, I was involved in helping uh, train uh, uh, Dr. Freelich and, and uh, 
when he was a med student resident, I was Dake, Dr. Davis' advisor when he was in, in, in med school. And Dr. Deal, uh, I met when she rotated here, but uh, knew about her and recruited her here. And she's been here for, I think, 11, 12 years now. So, so we have a, a, a very busy division that does everything you can imagine, neofemoral condyle grafts for scaphoid non-unions, and as I mentioned, uh, the whole gamut of hand, wrist, elbow surgery, microsurgery, and uh, congenital and brachial plexus. So um, it's a fun rotation, great educators, and we do have a tremendous number of our residents going to hand surgery um, over the years. We have a very strong uh, hand fellowship alumni uh, group, and uh, I'm extraordinarily proud of the, the division. Uh, just like I'm extraordinarily proud of the department. So, uh, so that's a hand, uh, it's a little Sam summary of the hand division. Dr. Freelay, Dr. Uh, Deal, I know you're on the line. I think Dr. Dacus may be. So if you have anything to add, please do not hesitate before I start talking. We also do axillary artery dissections, correct? What was Pardon that? Pardon me? And so we also do axillary artery dissections sometimes, Bobby. Oh, yeah, with sports <laughs> yeah, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, that's the sports extremity. So, Dr. Deal, you have uh, any comments? No, I think that was a great intro. Um, we love educating med students, residents, fellows, and um, so we're excited about you know education, research, and clinical stuff. We just got out of the OR at you know six thirty or something. We had a great day. It was really fun. Did a bunch of interesting cases, and um, just just love it. Love being in the OR and. Um, and working with, with residents, med students, fellows. So that's it. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, we have uh, you know, two, two ortho residents and uh, one plastics resident and two fellows. So that's, and we have six faculty. So there's plenty of cases to go around. There's fellow level cases, there's resident cases. So high number of cases done on the hand service. So yeah. thanks. anyway, Bobby. sure. So Winston, should I go ahead and start? Yeah, go for it, my friend. All right, um, and happy to stick around and answer any questions. So one of, uh, a big portion of my practice is elbow and uh, I love elbow surgery, uh, fractures, reconstruction, re replacements and sports in particular. And one of my favorite surgeries is uh, onocleidal ligament reconstruction in, in pitchers. And I'm going to go ahead and just give a brief uh, talk because I have I know we have some cases. So the elbow anatomy, um, of course, always start with anatomy on the lateral side. The lateral collateral ligament has four parts, the annular ligament, the accessory collateral ligament, the LUCL, and the radial collateral ligament. The medial side or the ulnar side, the UCL has three parts. Anterior bundle, which is the most critical and it's what we reconstruct when we do a UCL reconstruction, the posterior bundle, and then the transverse bundle, um, that you can have injuries to any of these bundles in, 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 as a pitcher. So just to give some, some idea of what a epidemic throwing injuries are, and maybe that's not the best word to use right now, but uh, 1.7 million high school throwing athletes, 90,000 NCA throwing athletes across the country, Little leaguers, 30% of little leaguers have shoulder elbow injuries. And those are usually, usually physio injuries, right? Stress reactions along the physis because they have open growth plates. High school uh, baseball players have 20% of them have shoulder and elbow injuries. And NCAA players, uh, almost 34% have shoulder and elbow injuries. And then when you get to the professional level, more than half of pitchers have shoulder and elbow injuries that require some sort of treatment. So obviously it's a very... Uh, uh, a very common uh, uh, problem in throwers. So when you have an overhead throwing uh, uh, athlete and they complain of elbow uh, pain, there's, uh, there's a very limited number of things it can be. It can be a UCL injury, which is the most common on the medial side. Valgus extension overload is a sequela of UCL injuries where you get osteophytes in the back of your elbow and you get pain uh, posteriorly as well as on the medial side of your elbow. You can have uh, cubital tunnel syndrome or irritation of the ulnar nerve uh, at the elbow from repetitive activities. Osteochondritis dissecans is seen in adolescents who are uh, th high level throwers. Um, that's on the lateral side of the elbow and it usually involves the capitellum. And that's a vascular insult to the cartilage of the capitellum. Then of course, little leaguer's elbow I mentioned is a physeal 
stress reaction when growth plates are open. The growth plates are trying to close, um, but they, uh, the stress from pitching and the stress of the ligament. Remember, when kids are young, the physis is the weakest part of the joint. So you have physeal fractures, not ligament injury. But once the physis closes, then the ulnar collateral ligament becomes the weakest structure in the elbow and is, and, and is uh, predisposed to injury. And then, of course, you can have tendonitis, medial lateral epicondylitis. Throwing has five stages, the wind-up phase, the cocking, late cocking, acceleration, deceleration, and follow-through. An injury occurs through the late cocking and acceleration phase. And when someone has is hurting and they may have a partial UCL and they continue to try to throw, one of the things that uh, is evident is they lose their velocity and they lose their control. Uh, and because the most of the pain occurs during the late cocking and acceleration phase. So what about different pitches? Fastballs and sliders are the most similar and curveballs are difficult, different. So fastball and sliders have the greatest segmental annular velocity and the highest torque and force on the shoulder and elbow, whereas a curveball has the highest angular velocity on the elbow. And that's why when we talk to the little leagues uh, around town and I've given many talks to the, the McIntyre Little League here over the years about controlling pitch counts and, and avoiding curveballs. And, and there's a reason for that, um, particularly as they transition from, uh, uh, you know, skeletally immature to skeletally mature, uh, they can uh, have a, 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 a ulnar collateral ligament injury at a young age. Medial elbow pain, what is the differential diagnosis? A UCL injury, medial epicondylitis, ulnar nerve compression, or little leaguer's elbow. So depending on the age uh, and your exam findings, this should be in your differential when you're, when you're evaluating a thrower with medial elbow pain. This is an important uh, slide to understand the anatomy. The anti so the anterior bundle is in divided into the anterior and posterior bundles. Okay, so the anterior bundle, sorry, is, the, yeah, is the, the anterior bundle is divided into the anterior band and the posterior band. So split the, band, the anterior bundle in half. So the anterior band of the anterior bundle is the primary restraint to valgus stress from zero to 90 degrees of elbow flexion. And then in higher, in higher period, uh, degrees of flexion, the posterior band of the anterior bundle is the primary restraint to valgus stress. So the entire anterior bundle is important uh, during the throwing motion, but different aspects of the anterior bundle are important for stability in different aspects of the throw. And that's why late cocking and acceleration uh, is where this most stress is put on the, the anterior bundle. So rupture or injury occurs due to repetitive high velocity and valgus stress to the medial aspect of the elbow. And as pitchers get tired, their mechanics suffer. And that's usually why you see it later in the season. But in, improper mechanics, inadequate conditioning, high pitch counts, and poor, poor flexibility all contribute. And the most force is during the late cocking and acceleration portion of the throw. And that's when the, an the anterior bundle experiences the most force. And that's when injuries happen. So an elbow valgus load increases with poor throwing mechanics. All these pitchers are taught to throw with their uh, um, arm in the highest position. So their shoulder maximally abducted and the ball in a high point. But as they get tired, um, they, they drop their shoulder and then they lever more around their elbow. And then that puts more stress around the elbow. And that's why we see many of these injuries uh, as the season goes on. How do they present? Medial elbow pain, they may have felt a pop, but sometimes they don't, just they get pain. And they have loss of velocity and loss of control, as I mentioned. They'll be tender over the medial side of the elbow. They'll have sensitivity potentially over the ulnar nerve because it's of repetitive activities, the ulnar nerve can get irritated, particularly if they have the subluxating ulnar nerve. And you want to test the UCL. The valgus stress test tests the anterior band of the anterior bundle, and the milking maneuver tests the posterior band of the anterior bundle. And an injured ligament results in laxity, pain, or apprehension when you do these, these tests. So here's the valgus stress test. So that's the anterior band of the bundle. Remember the one between zero and 90? And then the, the milking maneuver, which you can even have the person do themselves, is with higher degrees of elbow flexion, and that's the posterior band of the anterior bundle. And if they have pain in any of these maneuvers along the medial elbow, you should be concerned for a UCL injury. Plain films are, have limitations. Uh, you can look for avulsion fractures 
or a joint line discrepancy, but it's pretty rare. As long as your radio head is intact, that's a secondary uh, stabilizer to valgus stress. So it's really hard to make that determination on the stress view. You can see on the right, there's a avulsion injury um, that it should, you should have a high suspicion, suspicion for a UCL injury. MRI is the gold standard, but it's a MRI arthrogram. They have to put dye in the joint and you should look for dye leaking out of the joint. So they put it in from the lateral side and it will leak out of the joint. And you can see a partial UCL tear. There is a small band here, but there's dye leaking out of the joint. And that is a, that is a, a diagnostic. So here's a, a normal UCL, the origin, the distal medial epicondyle, and then the insertion on the subline tubercle. And then here's a T sign where a contrast escapes and you can see it lighting up the muscle because the contrast is escaped. And that's the T sign, a complete detachment of the UCL from the subaligned tubercle. And this is a high grade mid substance tear. You have gadolinium or contrast in within the ligament. Uh, and that's, a, that, uh, that's again, a, a different location of injury. So how do you treat these? A partial tear is a sprain. Um, no throwing for 12 weeks if it's a first time injury. You can try a hinge range of motion brace, initiate therapy, flexor pronator strengthening when they're no longer painful, and then do a graduated throwing program at three months. What about surgery? Uh, you can do, uh, uh, and there's some, another, you can, in, there is some literature that supports for partial uh, ligament injuries. You can try PRP as an adjunct but it doesn't accelerate return to throw, return to, to, to throw. So it's not like you give them a PRP injection and they'll return at two months to a throwing program as opposed to a three. You still keep them at a three month from throwing, but it may be an adjunct for healing. Um, what about surgery? An acute, a, a complete acute rupture or failure of three to six months of conservative management and inability to uh, progress through a throwing protocol or chronic insufficiency, meaning they have recurrent medial pain that may get better, but then it continues to bother them and impacts their throwing. So I tend to be, as long with Dr. Dacus, who does a lot of these as well, um, uh, UCL reconstructions for acute ruptures and chronic ruptures. Um, and uh, you, there is a, some literature saying to do an acute repair uh, of the ligament and then use an internal brace with a collagen tape um, that has been done in high school pitchers by Dr. Dugas down in Alabama, and now he's starting to uh, do them on some college pitchers with the hope that they may return a little bit sooner than a reconstruction. But as of still now, the gold standard for a high-level pitcher is a reconstruction with an uh, autograph. So the initial surgery was done on Tommy John by Frank Job in 1986, and this was the article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And uh, after a very uh, trying time, Tommy John could not throw anymore, and he had a chronic UCL insufficiency. He went to the OR in 1974, had a, a UCL reconstruction. They took down the entire flexor pronator mask and drilled tunnels on both sides of the elbow and passed a, um, a, a figure of eight palmaris, contralateral palmaris. They did not transpose the ulnar nerve. Um, at that point, post-operatively, Tommy John had a terrible ulnar nerve neuropathy that required surgery, and it took a significant amount of time before he had intrinsic function return, and he was out for almost 18 months before he started pitching again, but then he went on to a very storied Hall of Fame career after the surgery. So uh, prior to this surgery, um, UCL injury was career-ending for a pitcher, so it was a surgery that was designed specifically for pitching. If you have a we have plenty of football players, wrestlers. They have complete UCL injuries. Our line, football linemen all the time, complete UCL injury, put them in a brace, put them out there. Because your radio head is secondary stabilizer, as long as you're not throwing, you can live, you, you will recover fine and you won't need a surgery. The only uh, individuals I've done surgery for this are uh, obviously baseball players, um, occasional softball player, and uh, javelin and volleyball. So those are the, the this is a, this is a surgery that was created to solve a problem in, in very valuable athletes at the professional level. So players often reported they felt stronger after reconstruction, but still some concerns. 20 to 30% did not come to back to the prior level 
of play and, and many had ulnar nerve symptoms post-op and needed some intervention. So the surgery was further popularized by the most famous orthopedic surgeon in the country and the world, really, Dr. James Andrews currently. Dr. James Andrews did his fellowship here at UVA with Frank McHugh, my mentor, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, Dr. McHugh was the team doc for UVA athletics for 43 years. He passed away about eight, nine years ago. But his first sports fellow and hand fellow, he had a hand, he was 50% hand, 50% sports. But his first fellow was Jim Andrews. Uh, and Dr. Andrews uh, was a pioneer for shoulder, elbow, knee surgical techniques and re re rehabilitation. And again, as I said, he completed his fellowship in 1972 at UVA. So since since 1986, there's been a lot of modifications to the technique. There was the Job technique, the docking technique, the Andrews modification, the modified Job, the interference screw, the hybrid, the modified Paletta, many more. If you look at this list, and any major league player will have Andrews, Alchek, or Alatrush uh, do their surgery. Um, they, they are the big names for the professional uh, throwers. So the fundamental question for uh, this surgery is what do you do with the ulnar nerve? What do you do with the flexor pronator origin? What do you do with humeral fixation? And what are your graft choices? If they have a ipsilateral pulmaris, that's what I plan to use. And if they don't, then uh, use the contralateral hamstring. Um, uh, or uh, those are my two choices uh, for autograft. So this was the figure of a job where they took down the entire flexor pronator mass. The Andrews technique is with the ulnar nerve transposition, and he uh, also elevated uh, the flexor pronator mass and did a, uh, a slightly different weave. Elatrush uh, developed the interference screw technique, which I used to do the Andrews technique, and now I do the interference technique. Um, but uh, and this was also done with ulnar nerve transposition. So there's several different types, and I just showed you a few, but. Rehab-wise, immobilization of the elbow for about two weeks, then start elbow range of motion, strengthening at four to six weeks, no valve stress until four months, start tossing at four months, light throw from a wind-up at six months, graduated program of range of motion, strengthening and total body conditioning at seven months, 50% throwing effort, 70% max at nine, throwing at one year if no pain, 18 plus months to return to previous level of play, rehab should be carefully supervised. This is the Andrews protocol and everyone in the country uses essentially this protocol. If you look at return to previous level of performance, regardless, you know, it's, it's a little variable um, in, in that the Job technique when they first started doing it was 63%, and now we're up to 97% with the different techniques that are being used. And looking at the literature, um, this is systemic re uh, systematic review of 405 cases. 83% excellent results, 10% complication rate. Many had post-op ulnar neuropathies. Muscle splitting was better than detachment and ulnar nerve still can be a problem if you're not careful. And docking technique was associated with a better outcome. This had a review of 1200 UCLs over 19 years. Again, 83% uh, at same level or higher. So you're not guaranteed to return to the same level of play. About 20%, I tell, uh, my throwers, 20% chance you won't return to the same level of, of effectiveness in the thrower. And some and some people and people continue to have ulnar neuropathy. So it's very careful to do, you have to be careful around the nerve. So I do a I used to do a docking, I did a docking reconstruction technique for years, but now I'm doing an interference screw technique because I can double and triple uh, band the uh, repair because I have much more palmaris length. I do a muscle sprinting approach. Uh, I do palmaris or hamstring. And I use, do always do an ulnar nerve transposition. And that's an example. So in conclusion, injuries of the elbow are very common in overhead throwing athletes. Throwing mechanics are super abnormal, leading primarily to overuse injuries. And awareness and improved mechanics can prevent injuries. Can be career-ending injuries in overhead throwing athletes if, if uh, they don't have surgery. Numerous reconstruction techniques are available. Post-technique, post-op techniques are essentially the same. There's still no guarantee that athlete will return to pre-injury level of throwing. 80% uh, will probably, and 20% will not. Complication rate is not insignificant, and the ulnar nerve complication can be devastating in the throwing. So 
that is a whirlwind tour of UCL construction. So, as Max. As always, Bobby, that was awesome. Uh, I'm kind of losing you here. I'm not sure you're having a stroke or anything. I'm happy to answer any Hopefully questions. Soon. Otherwise, I guess. If I, so, uh, can I ask you a question, Bobby? And if anybody has any questions, please. Uh, yes. under, you can certainly unmute yourself and ask. But um, so, my 13 year old is an awesome pitcher. He throws 90 miles an hour. At what age on a male do you start thinking less about a physial injury or a, a little leaguer's elbow and more about a, an ulnar collateral ligament injury? So, first of all, if your son, and I know your son's not 13, but if you have a 13 year old throwing 90 miles an hour, he shouldn't even go to college. He should just start going to, he should go pitch in the majors right now. But um, I know the question you're asking is when should you be worried? So the youngest UCL I've done is, is 13. So, so the reality is, is um, you would expect a 13 year old to still have open fices. And remember, if you remember your anatomy, the, the, the fices close at different points around the elbow, the capitellum first, the radial head, uh, the medial epicondyle, the, medial epicondyle um, the trochlea, uh, the olecranon, and then the lateral epicondyle. So they, they, they um, close at different points and, and at different ages. So um, the reality is, is you have to um, obviously get a plain film. And if they have open fices, they very likely don't have a UCL injury. The chances you can still have both, but in most cases, as I mentioned, the, the weakest part of the ligament, uh, the weakest part of the joint is the open physis. So shut them down until their physis close and they should be fine. The problem is some of these young pitchers, they just kind of try to pitch through it and they fracture their epicondyle and those, and if it's a displaced fracture, they need surgery. Um, but really the question is, uh, Winston, you know, if their physis are open, assume it's a physial stress reaction shut them down and they should always get better. Um, but some, the transition is around 13 to 14 years of age. Uh, you said for I have a there, there's a question. Uh, yeah, the, we do. Yeah. All, I mean, there's only two replant centers, uh, in the state of Virginia, VCU and UVA. So anything that needs to be replanted comes to us and Carillion too does some as well. So two and a half, um, but yeah, we, a lot of the replants that need to be done. And as that was part of the microsurgery discussion, uh, we do quite a bit of microsurgery here. And the other question is without over tightening. Um, that's a very good question. Um, so this is not like the lateral side where you have to find an isometric point where the graph is tight in flexion and extension. So you have to find the isometric point in the lateral epicondyle and on the crista supernatoris. So you, to keep the radial head from rolling off the radio capitellar joint when you do an LCL reconstruction. The uh, medial side is I tension it at 45 degrees and I want it as tight as and it, with various stress to close the joint and to make it as tight as possible through a range of motion. All these graphs tend to stretch a little bit, but the importance here is you want uh, it to be tight in, in between zero and you want it to be tight throughout the entire range of flexion. So you want to make it as tight as possible at about 45 degrees. And the risk of re-rupture uh, after these surgeries or rupture of the graft, it's not insignificant. If you look at the data anal analytics and those of you who like, you know, if you watch a movie like Moneyball, baseball is all about analytics. Some people would say that the, uh, the Tampa Bay Rays lost their uh, game, they lost the the, the last game because of analytics, they pulled the, the, their pitcher out when he was uh, performing well, but they, you know, they pulled him out based on analytics. But if you look at the analytics of UCL um, injuries, uh, a professional baseball player who has a UCL injury, the chance, there is a significant risk of having a second UCL injury within seven years of the first reconstruction. So re-rupture is possible, and that's why you'll see that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, teams will not sign a pitcher after their seventh year from a UCL reconstruction because the analytics show that they they're at risk for another uh, rupture. So rupture is possible, 
and the return to uh, pitching at the same level after a second time UCL is below 50%. David, no more question. Yeah, Dr. Chabra, I want to ask about um, prevention and, and pitch count. Do you, is that more of a cumulative effect like throughout the season or a more intensity thing? And do you have numbers that you quote when you're talking to trainers and pitchers and coaches? It's a cumulative effect um, and it's fatigue. And, um, you know, there, there, there are uh, accepted pitch counts for Little League. So this is not something that I came up with. It's the American... Uh, Sports Medicine Society and the American Pediatric Association came up with numbers of how frequently a pitcher can uh, and can throw, how many pitches they can throw, and and, and within a game, and and um, it it is a result of cumulative uh, uh, throws and and fatigue and types of pitches thrown. Does that make sense? Thank you. So the question about mechanical quarterbacks don't throw as often and don't throw with the same velocity and they don't require the hyperflexion needed to throw uh, a, that a baseball does. And um, quarterbacks don't need UCL. I mean, I, I don't know, I guess theoretically, Ben Roethlisberger may have had a UCL reconstruction, not quite sure what elbow surgery he had, but um, Russell Wilson had a partial UCL tear in college, never had surgery. I think he turned out okay best quarterback in the MVP this year. So uh, if you choose to transpose the ulnar nerve, is there a consequent consensus on preference for, yes. So I do a subcutaneous. Uh, I don't want to, I already split the muscle. I don't want to mess up the flexor pronator anymore. And if you, uh, if you do a submuscular, you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to create more injury to the muscle. Um, and I have actually seen heterotopic ossification uh, from a uh, submuscular transposition uh, after, uh, for a Tommy John surgery. Um, so uh, almost everyone who uh, does this and uh, pretty much anyone who does it subcutaneous, who does ulnar transposition with a Tommy John surgery or, or a UCL reconstruction, is a sub they do the subcutaneous transposition. So Tommy John himself required a uh, self-split surgery to remove HO and to transpose his nerve, so. It wasn't done in the initial one and he had he had ulnar neuropathic symptoms pre-op and they chose not to do ulnar nerve transposition. So if you read that article, but anyway, anybody who loves uh, the throwing shoulder and the throwing elbow, there's a book by Jeff Passan called the arm, which is a pretty good book. If you guys want to do some, some good reading about um, the most valuable athletes in the world. And this surgery was designed to keep them pitching. Yeah. But it's been a sort of an epidemic to some degree. So uh, Max Hogger is going to is going to um, get us going on some cases. Okay, so Max. Yeah, Trevor Lawrence just tested positive for COVID nineteen. How interesting. Clemson may lose a game this year. Then uh, they probably, probably they probably have a five star backup. I'm sure. Right. Right. All right. So. Um... We've got a few minutes left, uh, so we'll kind of go through these quick. I've got a couple teed up that are um, fairly similar, um, but there's a couple subtle differences that we'll kind of point out. So um, everyone hear me okay, I'm assuming. I'm just going to keep rolling. Um, We're good. First one is an 18-year-old um, freshman pitcher um, who uh, came to see us at the hand center. He had three weeks of uh, right medial elbow pain. Um, initially started after a throwing session um, in his uh, uh, early season training. Uh, he's right hand dominant um, and talking to him about his throwing history and his elbow history. Um, he had been told as a teenager that he had little leaguers elbow or little league elbow, however a lot of people call it different things. Um, and so he's had, he endorses intermittent episodes of elbow pain essentially from his young um, throwing career up until this point. Um, and it's usually, he said stuff that would come, kind of come and go, but he could throw through it to the point where it went away and it would come back every now and then. So um, that's an important thing, I think, to ask most of these kids that are higher level uh, pitchers, because almost every one of them has got a history of elbow pain. So um, important part of your HPI. Um, this is his exam. Um, so he's got tenderness um, 
at both the humeral and ulnar insertion of the UCL, um, all of those special um, provocative maneuvers that Dr. Chauver talked about um, were present. So he had a positive milking maneuver and a positive uh, moving valgus stress test. Um, he did not have any nerve symptoms. So he, he did not have a tenels at the elbow. So you tap at that, the kind of the groove of the medial avocado where the ulnar nerve is, and that did not cause any paresthesias. Um, and uh, importantly for him, uh, kind of a foreshadowing, he did have a, a present palmaris tendon, something you always want to uh, check for. Um, so he showed up to us with an MRI um, already completed um, and was told he needed to see us for, for treatment. So we'll kind of scroll through this. Um, not the best MRI. And in, in the essence of time, I'll just kind of walk through. And, so go back again. Uh, yeah. A couple. Um, we got 10 minutes or 12 minutes, so we're good. Okay. Um, well, if see. anyone wants to, to kind of tell me what they see, um, just big things. The, the raise hand feature, or you can just start talking, you know, if you feel. And stop right there. Yep. I'm guessing it's a time to own our flower ligament injury. So that's, that's my guess. So that's, so that's a classic picture there. If anyone wants to describe it, I'm going to take her tonight. Okay. No worries. Just keep going, Max. Yeah. So I think the easiest thing Dr. Chaga talked about. Um, so these are MRIs uh, with uh, that have an arthrogram component. So there's dye into the joint. So this is what all this bright stuff is. And this is what the classic T sign is. Okay. So medial side of the elbow and has a T sign. Um, so that's where the ligament is disrupted and that contrast leaks out. And this, this one was particularly um, noteworthy because this is all contrast dye into his flexor pronator mass and the musculature of his forearm. Um, and so uh, obvious that he had a tear here. And so if you kind of scroll through, you know, the, the ulnar uh, insertion clearly has a tear there. You could see, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but where the, the, the T part of the limb going distally exists. But if you keep scrolling and look kind of at his ulnar or uh, at his humeral insertion, not the sharpest looking thing at all, right? So clearly he's got some degenerative stuff within the ligament itself um, and probably is reflective of, of his long time issues with, um, with elbow pain. So he probably had a, a previous injury based on his MRI um, and the, the radiologists agree with us here. So prior high grade partial injury, um, with an injury, uh, an acute component on top of that with a positive T sign. So, um, so he was taken for, um, UCL reconstruction, um, just like Dr. Chauver talked about with the interference technique using a Palmaris graft. Um, and the nice thing about that is if you, you get a pretty good size graft, and I don't remember if you mentioned it or not, Dr. Chopper, but you can actually take that and fold it over itself, you know, three to four times once you've docked it um, in the insertion points. Um, and it just kind of gives you a, a more strength and more bulk to your repair. And Dr. Chopper also uses a collagen wrap on top of that. So it's a, it is a massive, um, very, um, very strong, uh, reconstructive technique, uh, which I think is um, a pretty cool thing. And so um, that was his exam, his first post-operative visit. I don't have any intraoperative pictures, but um, was doing well. You could see here's where we docked our anchor, that kind of uh, faded area. It's not um, super obvious, but has good elbow alignment. So that's a big thing you're looking at. His, his joint space is, uh, is congruent. His elbow is reduced. Um, and so he. this is a case we did probably, I don't know, probably three weeks ago, Dr. Schaub or something like that. Right. Three Not weeks. Long ago. Um, he's, he's, well, what, you know, the point, the one thing that's frustrating with doing the, the loop technique, drawing drill, putting drill holes proximal and distal and looping and doing a figure of eight, you always run out of, um, of uh, graft frequently. And then the docking technique where you insert it distally and then dock it and tie it over behind the humerus, it's hard to get the tension right because the graft bunches up in your hole and your in your humeral uh, tunnel. Um, so docking it with these absorbable suture anchors and getting the tension as tight as possible 
uh, it makes tensioning much easier. But the main thing too is you have a lot of extra graph, so you can triple barrel your 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 graph, your, your the width of your uh, reconstruction. So it's a much stronger repair. Yeah, I think he's able to quadruple barrel it. I remember so. Um, so he's doing pretty well. He's in the early stages of his rehab. So um, this next one, very similar um, uh, kind of story, but a couple different things that uh, just to point out. So another 18 year old pitcher, different college. Um, so he he felt an acute pop in his elbow um, during a, a, a simulated game, um, and he showed up. To, to our clinic, uh, I think about the next four or five days afterwards, he had pain and paresthesias uh, in an ulnar distribution since then. Um, and teasing out his prior elbow history, he had not really had any problems before. So he had not really had significant pain. He had never been diagnosed with little leaguer's elbow or medial epicondylitis or anything like that. Um, he did have a history of a shoulder dislocation on the contralateral side that he had a surgery for, but otherwise was pretty healthy from an elbow, elbow standpoint um, before then. Um, so this guy, uh, um, he, uh, he's about 6'3", throws about 93 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and Dr. Guatemi operated on his shoulder a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I operated on his elbow, but uh, go ahead with the exam. Yeah. Um, so he was tender over his UCL. He's got uh, a mildly po positive milking test. Um, at this point, his, his nerve symptoms uh, had started to resolve and were essentially normal on exam. Um, but otherwise, um, not quite as uh, classic of an exam as the other, as the other kid had. But um, so we were obviously concerned for UCL injury. And so this is his MRI. Um, and if anyone wants to point out some differences here, feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I'll just keep answering my own questions, which I'm fine with. Um, so go back one. There's kind of a good a good slide there and there. Um, so right there, um, Eric Larson, what do you see there? Right there, I see a uh, uh, an avulsion off of the humeral side of it. Or a, you know, rupture off the humeral side. Well, to me, it looks more like a mid-substance rupture, right? Yeah, you don't have that standard T sign that Max was showing us earlier. But that's a mid-substance tear. But then go to the next one, right there. So, so there's a tear off the insert. There's your T sign. Oh, okay. Right. So, so this was a UCL injury at the insertion, and in mid-substance. So he had two areas of injury to his UCL. Yeah. And if you look at either end, you know, there's not kind of that intra-substance signal necessarily, um, you know, kind of that ratty looking tissue that the last MRI had. So um, kind of the history and his MRI uh, are kind of uh, correlate with one another. This is kind of truly an acute injury um, versus something that's kind of been smoldering over time. Um, and then something else I thought was interesting. Does anyone know what this is here? That kind of streak thing that you can kind of catch. That is ulnar nerve. Yeah, yeah, nice. I don't know who said that, but nice job. Um, and so he had, again, consistent with his history and his exam, or not necessarily with his exam, but had some ulnar neuritis on MRI. So um, had kind of an, an acute uh, um, uh, irritation of his ulnar nerve associated with his injury. So that's kind of a cool thing I thought um, was unique with him. So. Um, important to tease that stuff out beforehand because these are the people that um, you definitely just want to go ahead and, and uh, transpose the nerve um, to prevent any of this residual stuff afterwards. So there's his read um, and kind of like we talked about a mid-substance and um, had the T sign as well. So the uh, insertional avulsion and as well as some signal within his ulnar nerve. And so uh, he had the same repair as our, as our last uh, kid did transpose his nerve. Um, and he's probably two and a half months out, I think, give or take. Yeah. He's uh, about, about, yeah, 10 weeks out. So he's, yeah. he's doing great. Um, yeah. so you can see the humeral tunnel right there in the epicondyle a little bit better here. And then 
it's a little harder to see, but the ulnar tunnel is right at the subline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where we, you know, dunk the grass. So good, but he's a, so he's a, um, and he will uh, start, um, you know, tossing in about uh, four months. So in about six months or so. Yep. Or so. But, yep. uh, Okay. So we're about, two, two great cases. Yeah, we're about at nine o'clock. And um, so if there's any questions uh, anyone else has or. Um, I have a question. What's happening in Barris's room? Who's that? You have Alyssa and you got Eliza. Is it the night flute? And holy smokes, why is everybody still at the hospital? Good gracious. They're hardworking. They're hardworking. <laughs> The mass utilization is very, uh, there's a high compliance rate. I like that. Yeah, I, guess I like it too. So, but I just, I, I won't get let everyone go. But again, um, thank you for participating in this virtual curriculum. And of course, thanks to Dr. Guacami for arranging this. Thanks for all the residents who are participating every Thursday. Um, I hope you've, uh, I think uh, this is the last lecture one, right, Winston? Yes, so, you know, uh, this is the last didactic. It's been, Bachman and I, this has been 17 straight Thursday nights with you all. So we appreciate, we've had a lot of fun. Hey, there's yes. Lisa, there's Liza. There they are. So they're yeah. busy working. So, um, well, but no, I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for being part of this virtual curriculum. I hope you learned a lot about our program. And uh, I hope you also learned a lot about orthopedics. Uh, but we have a very bright future in this department uh, and a, a tremendous commitment to education. Uh, and we're a growing department, as many of you heard when we talked about the Ivy Mountain Orthopedic Center and the new inpatient unit. Um, so uh, we uh, uh, are definitely in a very, uh, we're, uh, we're set up for the future uh, in, in a great fashion and uh, tremendous faculty and uh, um, a very comprehensive care. We cover all aspects of um, of um, orthopedics. So you will see everything between, you know, during your training. So, but thank you again. And thanks again, Winston. Thanks, yeah. Nicole. Well, there's a lot of love here. I mean, I swear it's a, it's a, it's an awesome group. And so everybody's asking me when I'm talking to y'all, like, what am I looking for in resident? I'm looking for Barris and Alyssa and Liza and whoever thumb that is. It's just like, it's a good group of people here. And so I hope we've been able to demonstrate that throughout this curriculum. Next uh, Thursday is going to be a resident only kind of sort of forum. There's a lot of you all. There's, I think there's 40 of you all who signed up for this. And so I'd probably break it up into small groups. If there's a resident you want to request not to be put up with, let me know if it's Barris or Alyssa, whoever it might be. So, um, but please, uh, I'm very glad you all are here. And uh, if you have any questions for me or, or Dr. Bachman going forward, please feel free to email us. Okay. I will, I will check in with you guys next week at the beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the uh, resident forum. And then Keith and I will sort of uh, log out and just hang out with each other in our own little chat room. So thank you all, Dr. Chopper. Thank you to the hand division. Thank you to uh, Nicole for doing an awesome job showing our research, Max, great cases. Tim, thanks for being here. And uh, the on-call team, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here too. All, all right, right guys. guys, have a good night. See you later, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.